And good evening. My name is Cindy Dillon, and I am the chair of the Lower Eastern Shore Sierra Club group. And tonight we are doing a webinar entitled Offshore Wind, the Challenges, the Research, and the Reality. Um, we are really pleased that you chose to spend some time with us this evening, and we hope that you will enjoy this presentation. I'd like to introduce again, Jackie Grinbrod, who is going to be our moderator for the rest of the evening. Jackie, your turn. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for being here. And special thank yous to our special guest speakers tonight. We are so appreciative of you taking the time to be with us tonight. We have Dana Nelson here and Dave Wilson. Dana Nelson is a Marine Affairs Specialist for North American Marine Affairs for Orsted. He's had a diverse career, including 12 years as a commercial fisherman and has spent several years as a contractor for the uh, Department of Defense. Dana previously served Orsted as a fisheries liaison officer supporting Mid-Atlantic Site Investigation Surveys. He's originally from Gibson County, I'm sorry, Gibson Island in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay, and he has lived in Ocean City, Maryland now for over 40 years. Dana is responsible for facilitating, maintaining, and improving relationships between local and regional uh, fishing fleets and also for other maritime stakeholders. Dave Wilson is a Maryland, uh, Maryland development manager for US Wind. He's a longtime resident of Worcester County and he has spent 28 years building bipartisan relationships with both businesses and the conservation community to restore the coastal bays watershed and protect and restore wildlife habitat. From 1997 to 2015, Dave served as public outreach coordinator and later as executive director of the Maryland Coastal Bays program. He is also the breeding bird atlas coordinator for Worcester County the outgoing president of the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership Board, and he is co-owner of Delmarva Birding Weekends with the former Salisbury Zoo director, Jim Rapp. Dave holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Penn State University and a master's degree from Boston College. He owns a farm in Wicomico County and his family has owned uh, residential and commercial properties in downtown Ocean City since the late 1980s. He lives now just outside of Berlin with his wife, Kyoto. So now we will get started and Dana, you're up first. So um, take the stage, my friend. Thank you everybody for inviting me here tonight. I am uh, honored to be here. I'd like to thank Cindy and Jackie for giving us the opportunity to present to you. I'm Dana Nelson here, the Mid-Atlantic Marine Affairs Specialist with Orsted. And as Jackie said, I am pretty much the boots on the ground liaison between the first, the commercial fishing community um, and the recreational uh, fishing community and Orsted. Um, our specialty pretty much resides offshore with lighting, marking, signaling, navigation, and all of those things that um, are associated with an offshore wind farm. But again, uh, my, my primary focus is with skipjack wind, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, and I'm going to do my best to kind of speed through this uh, in the spirit of time. The skipjack wind project is a 966 megawatt offshore wind farm. It's going to be about 20 miles off of the Delaware coast. It's going to generate enough clean, renewable energy to power about 300,000 homes in the region. And it's scheduled to deliver power to the grid in 2026. Orsted's commitment to Maryland is kind of exciting. Um, we've essentially committed to a steel fabrication agreement with Crystal Steel Fabricators in Federalsburg creating about 50 jobs. Many of you may be familiar with Sparrows Point. It's the old Sparrows Point location in the Baltimore Harbor. Um, we've also committed to an advanced foundation, com uh, foundation component center in federal, um, in, um, it, which is essentially 
and port upgrades to Trade Point Atlantic, which is going to create about another 140 jobs. And where I'm sitting right now is at our O&M facility in the West Ocean City Commercial Fishing Harbor, where we're going to build and construct the zero emissions offshore wind operation and maintenance facility um, to kind of oversee the Skipjack Wind Project. And we do a lot with STEM education and workforce grants to ensure the industry's immense opportunities are available and, and you know, to everybody and, and sustainable. Orsted is the global leader in offshore wind. We've got over 30 years of experience in offshore wind. We currently have over 7.6 gigawatts of installed capacity, and that's actually larger. We've got three and a half gigawatts currently under construction with over 1,500 turbines you know, spinning right now, generating um, great renewable energy in, in, in over 28 different wind farms uh, in operation. I am again part of the Marine Affairs team, and, and I'll go through this quickly. We are the primary and external liaisons to the Coast Guard, the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and Department of Defense. Uh, we also work closely with commercial shipping in North America, and we are tied very tightly to all the state and quasi-state entities and, and port authorities, marine pilot organizations, et cetera, and, and folks of that like. We do a lot of external outreach to the private maritime industry. Uh, a lot of, you know, their propeller clubs like the Atlantic Coast Sport Fishing Association, Ocean Pines Anglers and other sport fishing groups like that. We obviously have to work very closely with the port and harbor and safety authorities. So we um, have ongoing and continuous conversations with those groups and my specialty again, the commercial fishing industry, um, having been a, a prior and a previous commercial fisherman, I know lots of commercial fishermen up and down the East Coast. They have an obvious concern over offshore wind, and it's my job to kind of gather and express their concerns to the higher ups within in Orsted. And we also um, we also do a lot of work with the Army Corps of Engineers and obviously NOAA in in that respect. And we're kind of looked to as some of the the authority in offshore wind since we've been at it for so long. Our team will we'll blow through this, consists of a lot of ex-Coast Guard and military individuals, as well as commercial fishermen. And I couldn't be some of the brighter, it, they are some of the brighter people that I've ever worked with. Um, and what I've done, um, Cindy gave me a few questions and rather than go on and kind of beat our chest and talk about offshore wind, I'll try and tackle some of the questions and then, um, you know, in the spirit of time, kick this over to Dave. The first one was, are the wind turbines as close together as possible or could they be closer to minimize the area impacted? And, and I really like that question because um, I've done a lot of work in spacing up and down the coast, but the spacing between turbines is determined on a project by project basis. And, and it weighs out multiple variables, including you know, minimizing wake effects between the turbines and, and maximizing the, the footprint um, of our lease area. The current projects along the U.S. and Atlantic coast propose a spacing of a one by one nautical mile. And you'll see on the next slide um, why that kind of helps the maritime industry, but in some aspects um, hurts the offshore wind industry from an efficiency standpoint. But that one point one or the one by one nautical mile spacing is very good for navigation. These slides um, are kind of interesting because what they show on the bottom is uh, a Hornsby, uh, Hornsby 2 layout. And if you look at the bottom layout versus the top layout, you'll see a wide difference in the way that these two have been set up and designed. This is kind of an older school thinking. And what you'll notice is what we call a packed border or a packed front end. You'll see a lot of these turbines are right next to each other and they're done so to maximize the efficiency of like a northern wind coming in this direction. But what that does do is it kind of fragments or scatters some of the wind behind them. So you'll see the rest of them are kind of clustered in there and that doesn't bode well with navigation. It's a lot harder to drive a boat through something like this than something that laid out in a one by one nautical mile square scenario. The result of this layout 
comes from hours and hours of outreach with the commercial fishing world, with the pilot associations, with the shipping world. And they all decided and, and recommended that we go to kind of a one by one spacing for the simple fact that you can see on this next slide, it gives you the ability to transition or go through a wind farm with a very easy and confident layout from Northeast to Southeast, Northeast to Southwest, East to West, North to South and on and vertical and diagonal accesses. And from being a commercial fisherman myself, I would have no hesitation in being able to navigate through something that is literally spread um, a mile by a mile apart. The consistent turbine marking and lighting to aid the navigation and safety operations is in accordance with the US Coast Guard guidelines. So we've managed to work out a unique lighting and signaling um, scenario for the entire offshore wind farm. And again, another question that you had is, can you clarify about the known impacts that exist with installing wind turbines, you know, as specifically as it relates to seismic drilling, substate, substrate disturbance, and sound impacts? And one thing I know Dave will agree with, the seismic word, word has been used entirely too much in offshore wind because seismic drilling does not take place in offshore wind um, in geotechnical or geophysical survey work. So that's one of the things that we've been beat up about that really doesn't exist. The process of driving a monopile foundations into the seabed does emit sound under the water. To limit any potential negative impacts on marine mammals and other species, we use noise reduction techniques and technologies such as double bubble curtains. It sounds kind of funny, but a double bubble curtain is exactly what it is, and you'll see one of them in a second. Um, in addition to some of the um, above protected measures, the foundations for substations are installed in the exact same manner as the turbine foundations. This is kind of some of the mitigation. It's a neat looking picture. It's kind of active, but what you're seeing are, are actual pictures of bubble curtains in action. And what a bubble curtain does is it creates a wall, a vertical wall of bubbles to help contain the noise within that circle. And a hmm. lot of times we'll use either a single or a double bubble curtain, say that fast a few times, um, to, that, to help mitigate some of that additional noise. Another question that you had was, what do we know about the disruption um, to the acoustic environment when both wind turbines are installed during drilling and when they're operating. And again, we know that monopile driving process creates noise underwater, and we utilize, again, some of those noise reduction technologies to limit that impact. And during the operation, underwater noise from various offshore wind turbines is at least 10 to 20 decibels lower than ship noise in the same frequency range. And that's something that's really interesting. And that just came about after a 2020 Danish study. And additionally, offshore wind turbines are typically situated far enough from offshore communities so they will never hear or be affected um, by any of that installation. And what do we know about the, in, um, actually that was the same question. These are a couple of secondary noise mitigation systems that I just thought I'd show you that help kind of squelch any of the sound during construction. There are, again, single and double bubble curtains. We have what is also known as a shell and shell system where there's essentially a sleeve that goes around the monopile that's being driven and that helps break down the noise. And there are other systems that essentially wrap pilings with foam and nets and also have hydro sound dampeners that really go a long way in mitigating any of that. And again, there are a lot of questions that center around best practices um, during all phases of offshore construction, including the foundation, foundation installation. We employ a range of protective measures to ensure that no adverse impacts, that there are no adverse impacts to marine wildlife. And you've just seen some of them. Um, they include restic restricting vessel speed limiting certain activities to certain times of the year, mandatory dedicated observers on the vessels. We have what are known as PSOs and FLOs, protective species observers, 
and um, fisheries liaison officers, that their job is to constantly look out for marine mammals, fishing gear, and that sort of thing, and report it if we see it. And we track and record all observations of marine mammals that are and protected species throughout the construction activities. And additionally, the Skipjack Wind Project will continue, continue to monitor the, the leaf site for wildlife impacts conducted um, and, and proper mitigation as needed. And we do fishery studies two years before, two years during, and two years after. And we've already talked about the bubble curtain, so I'm gonna bounce right on past that one. And another question, and it's the last one, and in the spirit of time, um, I'm not sure when, when I get yanked off like the old gong show, but another question was, has the contractor obtained seabed topography for the areas where the turbines will be installed? If so, how confident are they in that the turbine equipment will be securely attached to the seabed and not affected by winds and tidal currents in that location. And I can say long before these locations are picked, uh, Skipjack Wind is currently, <coughs> prior to and during, we're in the final stages of a geophysical survey and have already conducted geotechnical surveys of those lease areas. And that's exactly what those surveys do. They monitor the bottom type, the structure. They take a look for any archeological things that we should avoid. If there's any known shipwrecks or historical things that um, we should stay out of the way or unexploded ordinances and things like that that we have to avoid. That's what those surveys help us identify. That information gets analyzed and it's, and it's used to inform where the best place to install the turbines in the lease area are. And, we were the first energy company to use um, to transition to clean energy from fossil fuel. And today we operate more offshore wind energy projects than any company in the world. And we use a lot of that experience to ensure that our projects are constructed and operated in the best ways possible. And this kind of gives you, as kind of I'm wrapping this up, a little bit of an example of some of the side beam sonar stuff. Some of you may have noticed a vessel in the commercial fishing harbor for the last two weeks. I think tomorrow is gonna to be the last day that it's here. Looks a lot like this boat. And they were out there doing some very benign geophysical survey work. It's like sending a depth finder down to the bottom and receiving a signal back up to a kind of a multi-beam streamer that kind of measures the return. And it gives an idea of the bottom composition. And um, in the spirit of time, I have, uh, I can go forever, but I think I will wrap up and let Dave take over. And I've got plenty more ammo for any questions and anything that may come along after after that. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. That was amazing. I'm I'm sure that that generated a whole host host of questions, actually. And, and now going I apologize to... for being in fast forward mode, but um, you know there's an awful lot of ground to cover here. No, oh, that's okay. We have questions coming down at the back end. So now, Dave, we will switch over to you, and the stage is yours. All right. I'll try to share my screen as well. And thankfully, Dana actually answered a lot of the questions that you had the same manner that I would have answered them. So that's good. So we don't have to rehash some of that. Well, again, thank you. And thanks to Dana, who's my competitor, but we're also friends. Actually, Chris Basin, who was works for Delaware for Orsted's one of my best friends. So uh, it's always good to see, you know, uh, some friends on uh, the the call. And again, thank you, Jackie, and to the the Sierra Club, the Lower Eastern Shore Sierra Club, for having me tonight. It's uh, it's uh, a labor of love for me, and probably for Dana as well, uh, doing some of this work and the team to work with are, are really great. So we're really lucky to uh, to be in this. Um, so again, uh, our lake, our, I'll show you the lease area in a second. It's about 80,000 acres. Um, we have about 1.1 gigawatts under contract right now, which uh, again, I'll talk about in a second. We have a great development team, which I mentioned, um, and we're actually based in New York City, although some of the capital is Italian capital, but um, we're based in New York City, um, at least um, the Apollo management is, and our office is at the top of the World Trade Center in Baltimore. So U.S. Wind uh, has an office in, right in Baltimore, which I'm at once or twice a month, roughly. 
Um, as a, a lot of you probably know, the Biden administration has very ambitious goals for employing wind offshore. Right now, there are only two projects in the water, about seven turbines, uh, some being built as we speak. Um, so not a lot going on, despite what you might see online about everyone killing whales and things. Uh, but <laughs> I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the, um, uh, you know, as you can see from here, basically from Maine to Virginia, we will have uh, offshore turbines potentially based on the projected, you know, ideas about lease areas. And then, you know, as you probably saw uh, over the past several years, uh, starting with the Governor O'Malley and then certainly the Power Act signed uh, this past year into law by by Governor Moore. Um, we have a lot of advantages in Maryland because Maryland is a, a forward thinking state and we, you know, have been able to take full advantage of that. Um, so again, our this is our lease area off of Ocean City. It's about 80,000 acres. Again, we don't own it. Boehm owns it, but uh, we are the lessee of that lease area. Um, the far right corner, you'll see that Marwin is our first phase that was awarded. It was an offshore renewable energy credit awarded in 2017. And that was followed by momentum in 2021, which you see in red there. That's about 55 turb turbines, a little over 800 megawatts of power. Uh, and we still have all of what you see uh, in, I don't know what color you call that, sort of greenish um, on the on the uh, western side of the lease area to be awarded by hopefully, you know, the state of Maryland or another state, we, we could um, fill that lease area with, with an award, preferably from Maryland, uh, in that lease area. And turbines there would be as close as about 11 miles from 84th Street. So that would be the the closest turbine. The lease area itself is about 10 miles away, but the closest turbine um, to Ocean City would be about uh, 11 miles, about 12.5 miles from uh, the the board, the pier downtown, Buddy Jenkins's property downtown. So um, again, I, I'll try to answer some of your questions uh, that you had and elaborate on what Dana said as I go through this presentation. But one of the things that we uh, have done is to uh, create uh, a scenario where we don't have lights on all the time. We don't, you know, as a wildlife guy, I wouldn't want lights at the top of turbines all year long. And so uh, the good news is that we've, we've agreed in our construction operation plan to employ um, ADLS system, which would basically mean that lights are off atop the turbines all but about five hours and 46 minutes a year. Uh, basically, any time an aircraft would pass within three nautical miles and be below a thousand feet. So any lights on top of the turbines would be off uh, pretty much 99.4% of the time uh, for the whole year. Um, and then at the bottom, the very bottom of the turbines, there is a light, but it's only visible from about four miles away. So from land, you wouldn't be able to see that light unless you're up really, really high. Um, and that's that's important to us for wildlife um, and for the view shed for, uh, for concerns that Ocean City had at that time. Uh, so where are we in the process? Uh, as you can probably see here, we are, uh, if you look at the little US wind arrow there in the orange towards the end, we're getting there. Uh, you probably are aware and thank you for those who came to the interesting hearing last night at the Ocean City Elementary, we uh, have we submitted our construction operation plan last year. Boehm released their draft environmental impact statement on that plan, and um, right now we're in the middle of hearings for that plan. There's a hearing in Dagsboro tomorrow uh, at five o'clock, uh, which uh, you may have seen from your uh, listserv, uh, and there's. Uh, virtual hearing on the 30th from five to nine, uh, where you can express your support, hopefully, or your, you know, detraction from uh, the project. So I uh, want to talk a little bit about cables. Again, you can see from here, cabling will go into Delaware, uh, into Three R's Beach, under Indian River Inlet. Uh, that's the best case scenario environmentally for sure. Um, but a good one for us too. Just to to clarify, when 
cables are buried about uh, two meters under the ground, the whole way from from the uh, four substations in the lease area to the beach. The, the beach, it goes in about 60 feet, it's drilled 60 feet under the beach where it enters the beach and certainly not during tourist season, but the impact there should be minimal. Um, there's no cables, of course, going to shore in Ocean City or Anastatee. You know, and as Dana said, you know, you can see, again, looking at that, it's easier to see on this picture. So I figured I'd mention it here. The, our turbines are a mile apart northwest, about eight tenths of a mile east-west. And so, again, based on what, what uh, BOEM and, and for navigation safety, that's the best case scenario. We wouldn't want them clustered together or, or set up in a disorderly fashion for, for safety purposes. Uh, and again, the turbines last, uh, I think you had a question about how long they last, about 25 years. Uh, but there, but that is just the general how long a, a turbine will last. They're constantly being repaired and parts are being replaced. And so we expect that that would be substantially longer than that. And the blades, I think someone asked what the blades are made of. They're actually made of uh, fiberglass and balsa wood. Uh, and nowadays, if you look at the online, you'll see that, well, offshore wind arrays used to be uh, not recycled or reused, but nowadays pretty much everything is recycled and reused after that 25-year period. So it's not a, a burden on landfills or, or you know, uh, it's it's greener than you, you might think. We'll leave it at that. Um, so the turbines that we have are really great for artificial uh, structure. So uh, so we took some folks out to Virginia where there's only two turbines. Uh, we took them out uh, at the end of August and we caught 101 black sea bass in about four hours. So uh, we expect there's going to be a lot of fishing around the turbines because there's a lot of vertical structure from the bottom to the top. There's only about 75 feet total disturbance where the monopile goes into the, to the seafloor. Um, there's only about 25 total acres of disturbance over the entire uh, 80,000 80, acre lease area. So that's a very small amount of disturbance. The actual the actual turbines themselves are only 11 meters in diameter. So they're not they're they're made to be thin. We don't want a lot of wind resistance. So, um, but again, the the structure is really ex pretty exciting for some of as Dana sort of mentioned, for some of the recreational fishing groups are getting ready to fish some of that structure, that vertical structure, which you get black sea bass at the bottom and then you get Kobe and dolphin and, and albacore and stuff at the top. So um, some good opportunities there for sure. Uh, again, you know, you see, I've seen, you know, Dane and I have to deal with stuff we see about whales online. Uh, our surveying, our geophysical and geotech surveys are actually done. Uh, we don't, there's, we don't the, based on the megahertz of of uh, both of those surveys, well, geo uh, phys or tech in particular, there's no reason to believe that that would harm a whale. We don't actually need a permit for it. We still have protected species observers on boats when we do surveying, but uh, that sonar is just something that whales and dolphins can hear. It's not something that would blow their ears out or anything like that. Uh, but that survey that is done for us. Um, and, if, and again, if we see whales when we're surveying, we don't want to disturb whales. Uh, we don't know that they, sometimes they actually swim towards the, the sonar, as <laughs> Dana probably knows, um, just because they're curious. But we also, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean is one of the loudest oceans on the planet. So uh, it's hard to hear if you've had your head underwater, if you're out surfing or whatever, you know how loud it can be. And, uh, and so that we don't, we expect sonar to really bother whales and dolphins at all. And there's really good science on that from University of Maryland and, and actually all around the world. We do have a real-time whale buoy uh, that, that's given us some great data too. And I can send around the link to look at the look at what that's finding if anyone wants to see that when we're done. Um, so uh, again, we talked about, I think I have the same exact photo that Dana had. We have double bubble curtains that we employ during um, during installation. The, the monopiles take about two hours to put in. So there's no seismic blasting or anything like that, like Dana said, but they're just hammered into the ground and Bohm sets the 
how loud that hammering can be. So you can't do five hammers that are really hard. You have to do 200 hammers that are, you know, softer. And so there, there with those double bubble curtains, that is substantial sound mitigation. Um, and again, we do it outside of whale migration season. We have protected species on board. We don't expect to kill or harm any marine mammals at all during any of this work. Um, sometimes when, you, when you're looking at, at uh, BOEM's work or National Marine Fisheries, you'll see that there's takes. I think we have a take for a couple hundred dolphins and a few, I don't know, dozens of whales, but a take means that you bother something, right? So if a protected species observer sees a whale and it's, and it's a half a mile away and it swims away, that's called a take. It's not, it doesn't mean you kill anything. We have no reason to believe we would kill anything. Um, and again, uh, we, we have a, we gave uh, UMSIs $11 million to do lots and lots of good research, some of which I'll show on the next page. But uh, our real concern is, vice, is vessel strikes, and that's why we have protected species observers. Um, and then commercial, you know, we don't, one of the biggest problems for North American, North Atlantic right whales is, is uh, commercial fishing. And there's no North Atlantic right whale that exists on Earth that doesn't show some sign of commercial fishing gear entanglement. Uh, so, and that's a 350 uh, animals. So um, we have to be real careful uh, with North Atlantic, Atlantic right whales for vessel strikes, but also working with our commercial guys to, to give them what they need to avoid that as well. Um, I could go on forever about all of the work we're doing for, we do digital avian surveys for birds. Uh, we're still doing those. I, I'd love to look at that data because I, being a breeding bird, I was coordinator for Worcester County. Uh, I really enjoy uh, the bird data. Um, we do acoustic monitoring for bats. We have um, benthic surveys, all in, not just in the ocean, but in uh, in the inland bays and in, in Indian River inlet area and in Indian River Bay. Uh, we also do um, acoustic monitors and detecting for a whole range of species, birds, bats, and fish. And so we're getting some really great data that no one has ever had before. I actually go out with them on the fishing surveys and uh, that's all going to be public data. So we're really excited about sharing some of that. Um, again, Dana sort of alluded to some of this, but uh, we are working with Warwick Community College. They are basically structuring their trades curriculum around wind turbines. This is a photo from, from their new building they have. They have a whole training session section on uh, wind turbine, uh, you know, maintenance, et cetera. And so we're real excited about uh, working with them, working with the Lower Shore Workforce Alliance as well, uh, who just recently got $700,000 for the Maryland Works for a Wind Grant. Um, I think it's worth noting too that, you know, we're doing everything we can to hire union labor in minority owned businesses. And we have full-time staff, multiple full-time staff on, on those uh, issues alone. And I think we're making some really good progress there. Uh, again, you look at the, uh, some of you are probably familiar with Sparrows Point, uh, Dana alluded to it. We're going to set up a, an East Coast turbine and manufacturing facility there. I'll talk about that in a second, but um, there's a lot of jobs total for both Morrowind and Momentum is about 5,460 jobs. Um, 100 plus will be at the local O&M facility in West Ocean City, where we'll also have a uh, once we settle, uh, luckily Orsted for them already got into a good spot, but there's not a lot of not a lot of real estate there. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we're we're I think we're finishing that up soon. But you know, 1.5 indirect and induced jobs for every job, so over 10,000 jobs over the course of 25 years, and you know that's 6.9 billion in GDP growth, which is substantial for the state of Maryland. Uh, this is just a trades list. You know, we're not, it's not all hires. It's, you know, contracting a lot of it. And so this is some of what U.S. women will need to contract over the course, both here and at Sparrows Point over the course of uh, the 25 years of, of work that we're doing. Uh, again, I, I alluded to Sparrows Point will be, you know, producing monopile, monopile foundations and transition pieces. Uh, and hopefully towers um, for all the East Coast. So it's not just uh, our project, but all the projects that need uh, this space to get that work done. So 
really excited about that. And you've probably seen, you know, Governor Hogan was there. Of course, uh, Governor Moore has been there twice and uh, some really great stuff going on. The work there has already actually begun. Uh, and again, lastly, the O&M facility in West Ocean City uh, will have, you know, basically an office there. We'll have crews mobilize three CTVs and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of action there at the harbor for, uh, for uh, folks who are interested in maritime work uh, in addition to uh, office work and other types of work. So I'll, get, I'll be spending more time you know, on that in the near future. And I'll give you the latest information on what's going on there. Uh, so yeah, I think that's it uh, for us. I think one question I didn't answer was the topography issue, you know, the, all the geotech and geophys work is done to examine the topography under the ocean. So we know that we're putting our turbines in a safe place and in a place that there are no cultural resources or natural resources that are rare or should be disturbed. So we're really, really good about that. So, um, and I put the link on there for the uh, the offshore wind for our draft draft environmental impact statement. You can see it, that link that is on the, uh, the last slide there. And that's it for me, I think. I wanted to say thank you to both of you. That was an extraordinary amount of information there for all of us to take in and process. And I'm sure we all have a lot of homework to do on all of that. But we were a little ahead of ourselves with time, so that means more questions can be asked. So now Cindy and Joe are going to take over that segment, and they will present the questions to our speakers. Okay, the first question came in. Uh, we've heard various numbers with regard to how far from shore the wind turbines will be. Is the distance that you're quoting tonight, are those the final numbers? Joe, I'll let Dana go first each time, and then I'll follow him. How's that? That works. So, sounds good. The distance, uh, yes, the distances that we are, that, that I was speaking of are our final numbers. Yes, sir. And that would be about 20 miles, 20 nautical miles from the Maryland-Delaware line. Our, our project by nature is just a little further to the north than the U.S. wind project. There are two totally different footprints and ours is um, just a little further offshore and to the north actually. Yeah, so right now for us, the closest turbine based on the two awards that we have would be 15 miles away, but our lease area goes to 10 miles with a one mile separation scheme, which would put the closest turbine to 11 miles if and when we're able to fill out the lease area with another offshore renewable energy credit. So, and that's, that's about 84 streets, the closest uh, spot. Um, the, the boardwalk pier is uh, about 12.5 uh, miles from if, the, and again, if that were to be uh, filled out. Thank you, both of you. Um, the next question is, what are double bubble curtains made of? Double bubble curtains are pretty much just what they sound like. It's a vertical curtain that has a series of air hoses hooked up to it that pumps air into it. And as the air goes into it, it gets, it comes out through like mesh holes in the curtain and it just creates bubbles. It's really a pretty simply simple design. So they're plastic? No, they're like a material. It's a fabric material. Um, it's a, a combination of a bunch of different materials. And I'm not an expert on the actual composition of it. So I, I can't tell you exact the exact compound or what it's made of, but it's a, you know, it's a combination of plastics and, and meshes and things like that that are fed with um, air hoses that create the bubbles on the inside. And they basically travel vertically up the side of the curtain to shield any of the noise that would be, you know, being admitted from constructions, the, the construction process on the inside of the curtain. Does the bottom of the curtains go all the way to the sea floor? Usually, yes. I, I've got some pictures that I can send and share some, you know, better detailed 
photos with the group um, later on, if you'd like. I, I don't know that it's worth taking the time to share screens and bounce back and forth like that. Yeah, well, let's do the questions, I think. Dave, Dave, Dave what were you going to say? I was going to say, yeah, you know, generally the ones we use, I think, will be going from the various from the surface to the floor. Um, but it is a really good industry standard. I mean, the science is really good about about mitigation of from megahertz. Uh, and so just so there's no whales with their head up against it, uh, we shouldn't we don't wouldn't expect any damage to any marine mammals certainly from from the pile driving and again we only do one pile one monopile a day it takes about two hours and outside of of whale migration and, and one of the things that dave mentioned earlier is with the psos the protective species observers in, in relation to viewing if if they see marine mammals and marine life there are a lot of times will they will stop the actual construction process and then there's a, a slow procedure to get cranked back up. So they'll shut everything down to nothing. So there's no sound at all. And then once they're confident that those mammals are out of that area, they slowly bring things back up. So it, it starts off at a very slow pace and then it winds back up. So the sound doesn't come back to where it was. It slowly increases back up to working levels, which is the, the most that anybody could possibly do. Yeah, I would, and if there's any cetacean within 500 yards um, of driving, it, we we stop. But when we start, we also, even if there's not a whale around, anytime we would start a, a new monopile, it starts real slow and light, and it gets louder and louder until the monopile is in, uh, just in case there's, a, you know, a, for there would be a whale or dolphin we didn't see, which is kind of unusual, but um, just... That's a, again just an extra precautionary measure. The next question is a two parter. What are your objections to alternative E, which is habitat impact minimization alternative? And the second part is how hard would it be to avoid those sensitive areas? Yeah, I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead, Dave. You want to take that one first? <laughs> yeah, I think that one is for our draft environmental impact statement. So, um, so the that is a very bad alternative for us for a number of reasons because it says I think nine or eleven turbines, but it would actually be more like twenty five or thirty because they're all randomly spaced apart. Um, we, I, I think, Bowen would probably agree, and and we think this is also true that. The, the reason it's that it is con considered habitat is because there's a little bit of a slope there, but there across the Atlantic, there are hundreds of millions of acres of this sort of topography. It's just a little bit of slope, you know, or a ripple on the bottom. Uh, it's very common habitat, but it's considered different than the other habitats. And so for us, it's like you know, we consider it a sort of like putting a pin in a football field. Uh, we don't. We feel like in a lot of cases, this is going to improve uh, fish habitat because that's the main concern is fish habitat. But um, BOEM has to do their due diligence, and and they have a standard, and as they have a uh, this sort of uh, topography, they have to note it in their draft environmental impact statement. So they they've done that to their credit, but. But, you know, again, from a wildlife standpoint, from a wildlife guy, I, I don't think that E is a good option for us because it would take power from about 150,000 homes in Maryland. So, um, you know, that's that's uh, not ideal for us. And again, our whole project at 1.8-ish megabytes would provide energy to a little less than 30% of all the homes in the state of Maryland all day, every day for 25 years. So that's a lot of energy. You know, one monopile is about 5,700 houses. So, um, yeah, we, we we have concerns about E, certainly. But I, I think that's a good question, though. Even a better answer. The next one is, are there lights at the bottom of the turbines for boaters? That, that's a great question. And the way that the lighting marking, at least the way the lighting marking and signaling um, scenario is unfolded, the, there are uh, there are lights on the platforms 
um, but they're not like at the water level, but they're high enough and, and, and have a wide enough radius so that like Dave mentioned earlier, as you get closer to them, they're brighter and they're not at a, such a high frequency where they would be a nuisance from the shoreline, but all the turbines will have a platform and on that platform, not only will there be lights, but there'll be an alphanumeric uh, numbering sequence as well. So if you look up and you see a, a alphanumeric numbering sequence, you'll be able to tell exactly where you are in the actual array or in the in the footprint of the of the wind farm. And as Dave mentioned earlier, there's also um, net um, aircraft lighting, which is a very um, kind of a, a neat way that it works. It works um, with a, a radar and it turns on when it senses a plane coming into its airspace and then it automatically turns off as that plane transition through and exits the airspace. So you're not gonna see obnoxious red lighting all the time, just a, a small portion of the time as Dave mentioned earlier. One thing I wanted to add before I forget too, now we're talking about visual impacts is that um, we, took, we took issue with the visual simulations that uh, Boehm had at the hearing last night. Uh, we didn't think they were anywhere close to the actual, what it would look like. Um, and we told them that and they have apologized and are going to change that because they took a, a closer view and it makes it look like the turbines are right in your face. And that is not how the industry standard for visualizations work. But if you go on our website, uswindinc.org, you can actually see a good video of the simulation from midnight to midnight. So that's, that's the best way to do it for our project, not use bones necessarily <laughs> from a, from a cardboard thing. It does, it doesn't work that way. That's how vision works. So uh, we were a little bit disappointed by, by what they presented at the hearing, but I think they're going to change that for the DAGS Pro hearing tomorrow. So and how are we going to get that information to the 300 people who took pictures of that and are spreading it around? Well, to, to speak to that as well, Cindy, and, and Dave's spot on with that, you know, the first things I, I mentioned was when you look at whether or not it's the U.S. wind view shed simulation or whether it's an Orsted skipjack wind view shed simulation, they always seem to be, and, and I can understand why, worst case scenario, and they're always at an elevation that is atypical to an average five or six foot human being standing on the beach. So most of their vantage points are from 16 feet up or the third floor of a balcony where that totally changes your viewing plane. And as the curvature of the earth dictates um, distance offshore, things obviously get further away. And um, with the whole view shed simulation, they always show the turbine with it forward facing, you know, with the blade oriented perpendicular to the beach or, or parallel to the beach. Whereas in a lot of cases in the summertime, our predominant winds are out of the south. So June, July, August, it's southern, you know, southerlies all day, sea breeze, and the turbines are going to be facing to the south, not to the west. So you'll be looking at a side profile versus a front profile the majority of the summer. And I cross the Delaware Bay on a weekly basis, and there is a turbine at the University of Delaware, and the Delaware Bay is 14 miles across. And almost every trip when I go across the Delaware Bay, I cannot see that turbine until I'm about halfway in the middle of the Delaware Bay. And that's because the, you know, um, the actual atmospheric conditions in the summer months, hot, hazy, humid conditions, don't they don't allow you to see as far. And the only time you can really have that good, if from running a commercial fishing boat in from offshore at night, I can tell you that in the fall, I can see shore from about 13, 14 miles away. You start to see the condos. It looks like a mirage. In the summertime, I cannot see the beach at all from that distance offshore. So there are a lot of different conditions that go to the view shed. And, and I agree with Dave 100%. That I didn't see it, but I saw pictures of it. And that was kind of grossly misrepresented. It's worth noting, too, that some people 
want to see turbines, right? I know a lot of, you know, our supporters, they're like, oh yeah, we're moving forward. It's, this is a beautiful thing there. You know, if you've been to Europe, there can be quite beautiful too. So, you know. Amen. That. Absolutely. Ready for the Jeff. next question? Yes, Jeff. Okay. It was stated that wind turbines are recycled. How are they recycled? What are the recycled products used for? I can tell you since night uh, since 2021, Orsted now recycles 95% of all of their turbine blades. And the 5% that they haven't or aren't recycling right now are they're staying out of landfills. So there are no turbines, no turbine blades going to landfills. And what they typically do, um, as Dave mentioned earlier, they're usually a composite with balsa wood, and it really varies from manufacturer to manufacturer what they're made out of. But one of the neatest things now, most of us are familiar with concrete, and concrete's made out of sand, and there's like this dust component to it. And they have figured out a way to grind these turbines up and use the dust in concrete, um, as well as a number of other things. So we're, you know, through academia and through a lot of other ways now, no longer are these blades being buried and, and being disposed of in landfills. They're all being reused, repurposed, or recycled, and, and we're happy with that. Yeah, the steel is largely recycled and the, the rest of the components are reused in some way. Okay, um, what mitigation strategies are used to reduce impact on birds? Well, I can tell you, um, we have done lots of studies to start with in terms of birds. Uh, we have a avian bat and bird specialists that work for us, that, that that's all their job to do is. and. As far as mitigation, obviously, we have researched flyways, the Atlantic Flyway and those areas. And when BOEM puts these lease areas up, it's a combination of studies that determine where those lease areas are. So there's been a lot of preliminary work outside of just the offshore wind companies um, that look into that. Like the gentleman mentioned earlier, the lease areas are determined after a lot of scientific studies, ethnic studies, avian bird studies, fishery studies, and the skipjack wind footprint um, from a fishery standpoint, less than 1% of the commercial catch came from that area. And in addition to all of the other studies that go into making sure we're not interrupting birds, uh, the lighting has been changed to, in some instances, lightings have been uh, the light viewing radius has been cupped or domed so that it doesn't, you know, attract birds or it doesn't affect anybody, any of the birds. The biggest issue that we were told that we have in our area would be bats. And I have been a commercial fisherman here for many, many years and spent a lot of time on the ocean, and I've never seen a bat offshore. So um, that's the best I can do on that one. And I, I, I can certainly put people in touch with our bird and bat specialists that could probably talk about that much better than I can as a fisherman. There was a similar question coming up. Uh, what is the truth, the response about pe people have concerns about birds getting killed? I'm happy to talk about birds and bats. If you want to yield the floor, Dana, unless you want that one too. No, I'll no, I was going to say I've got a slide on that one, but you're the bird man. I can tell you right now that um, to to really dummy it down, and and please don't take it personally if you've got one in your lap. But your home kitty cat kills more birds a year than offshore wind farms do, you know, and that's been um, kind of the the biggest eye opener. And glass buildings, there are a lot of other things, and. We just did um, a study in the UK, a two-year bird study, and zero birds were killed. And, and I've got that study on my computer. So um, I know there's a lot of work that goes into it, but Dave's, Dave's the bird, bird man. Yeah, so we, well, just real quickly with bats, we haven't had any bat detections in our lease area since we started uh, monitoring for them. So we don't think there are a lot of bats flying offshore, nor did we probably ever what we want to do that just to be on the safe side um for birds one of the things that the 
the monopiles have is anti-perching. There's no way to, we want to make sure there's no way a bird can perch on the monopile and then fly off and get hit by a blade. But for passerines, you know, passerines fly at two to 4,000 feet. That's your thrushes, warblers, vireos, et cetera, things that I count, you know, uh, here. And they fly on the mid-Atlantic uh, pretty well within 10 miles, uh, usually eight-ish miles offshore when they're flying from, you know, Nova Scotia or wherever south. Um, and so we don't have really major concerns about birds that are night migrants, like birds that run into buildings in Baltimore and stuff getting hit or running into turbine blades. Um, one of the, a lot of the really good work, and again, I used to do the legislative work for Audubon and Audubon is a big proponent of offshore wind. They're not a big proponent of wind inshore on mountaintops. I'm not really either. Uh, that's just my position, not U.S. winds. Uh, but I am a big proponent offshore because, you know, the the passerine issue I think is not a, a problem here. Once in a while, we'll see a boat captain that that has, uh, you know, a prothonotary warbler or a junco, forty five miles offshore. Well, that bird would be dead without that boat. So, um, those birds are way off course, and and uh, just again, just a handful of birds there. But seabirds, pelagic birds. If you look at Europe, they just basically fly around structure and they fly really low to the water. So the blade height is much higher than pelagic birds generally fly over water. If you ever see, you watch uh, brown pelicans, which generally aren't that far offshore, or other birds, seabirds, they fly real low to the water. And because they nest, because pelagic birds nest offshore, they're used to flying around structure. So you don't really have a big problem with offshore wind turbines. Um, and bird strike, uh, at least pelagic bird strike in Europe. Uh, there are some offshore wind turbines that are probably in migratory routes in Europe that maybe shouldn't have been built, but our particular lease area is far enough offshore that we don't worry about passerines, which would be my main concern. Again, warblers, thrushes, vireos, et cetera. Uh, and again, night flight at two to 4,000 feet and then uh, descending on you know the beautiful lower eastern shore that uh, we have or what we have left of it, which is still some good stuff in Worcester County. Okay, so the next question uh, probably concerns that uh, slide last night of uh, incorrect uh, positioning of the uh, turbines. What comparisons do you have on how visible they from the shore they will be? In other, do you have something you could pull up to show uh, what they might look like? I would have to dig for it. I mean, I've got a our, our, the viewshed simulation video that I could share with the group. Um, and that's what we have to compile and include with our COP. It's very similar to what US Wind has gone through. Um, I don't know that ours looks kind of, it, you know, just by the nature of the distance offshore of our project, ours probably isn't quite as, um, visible let's just say but i can certainly share that with the group and and give you guys a link to the whole entire view shed video yeah i have uh the video on our website uswinding.com uh, is probably probably the best uh place to go and look at the I think it's a four minute video from again from midnight to to eleven fifty nine the next day of what what it'll actually look like it's much better like, this is a july video so it probably would be more visible in january february but uh not super visible that those months can you put a, that, a link to that in our uh, chat yeah i'll do the same thing ours is up on our website as well good Great. good okay next one is the environmental impact statement no and i think maybe this is to you dave notes an adverse effect on some cultural resources, for example, shipwrecks. Can you identify what those are and how they would affect the location of the turbines? Uh, yes. Uh, so I think what Bohm is getting at there is that there is the, and again, you have to get into the mind of the federal permitting agency and what they need to cover. And that is that there, despite all the the extensive surveying, there, it's always possible that 
we could be putting cable in somewhere and and six feet under the ground there would be a shipwreck or something in which way in which case we would actually stop and have to reroute the cable but i think what they want to get is that you know there's always a possibility that there could be despite again despite all of the the, the surveying that there could be something there that you didn't see even when you're driving a monopile several feet you know 30 feet into the ground there could be something at the 29th foot that we didn't see we don't think that's particularly likely and with all just mostly sand um but that is a possibility so they put that into you know they put that into the column as a possible adverse effect you know you may have seen too there's i think it's said there's the potential for um uh, a substantial or major effect on north atlantic right whales from the project but it, but what they say that effect is not from any of the of the pile driving or the sonar it's from the possibility of commercial fishing gear getting stuck in a turbine monopile and a whale getting stuck in the gear that's stuck in the turbine so that makes that a potentially major impact but again you know that seems like a little tiny bit of a stretch, but again, something BOEM needs to do to make sure they're, you know, covering their bases and, you know, protecting wildlife. Thank you. Joe? So, uh, next question. What are the reactions to your project from the local fishing industries? Well, I'm a probably pretty good individual to speak on that. Um, when I first left the commercial fishing industry about a year and a half ago after 13 plus years as a local commercial fishing captain my name became benedict my last name became arnold and um i was accused of being a traitor and you know blah 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 i went through the that bit of grief but overall the initial reaction was you know you have to understand fishermen have been on the ocean for hundreds of years and we think we own the ocean and and we don't the ocean belongs to all of us everybody as ocean users has the the opportunity to be able to utilize the ocean and have access to the ocean and the fishing community holds their their heritage very closely to their chests and they've kind of operated in like a wild, wild west environment for a long time. And so anytime they see anybody coming into their area, they get a little defensive of it. And I think most of it has been based on lack of education and understanding of what we're doing. And when I initially started here, every single fisherman in the harbor was against offshore wind. Um, since I've started my outreach, a lot of them, a number of them still are, but on the flip side, I have the two largest commercial fishermen, um, a gentleman by the name of Mike, Mike Coppola, who owns a boat named the Instigator and his crew, and, and the older, the other most seasoned, experienced, and probably one of the most accomplished gill net fishermen now have both decided they should work with us and try instead of fight us. And what I mean by that, as they realized the need for offshore wind, as they've seen a serious shift in species over the year. So what I mean, the fish that we used to catch off of Ocean City are no longer here. They're up off of New York. The fish that were off the Carolinas are now up here. We, we catch, um, this summer they were catching tarpon in Nantucket, all right? Tarpon are a Florida fish. They are a Southern water fish. And when you're catching tarpon in Nantucket, you have to open your eyes. Even the most, um, even the biggest naysayer has to say, wait a minute, maybe this global warming thing is real and maybe we need to do something about it. So what I have found through education, through simply conversations like this and explaining to them the benign nature of our survey work, the, like, like Dave mentioned, the small impact and the small footprint that these turbines actually take up and then the biodiversity that they're going to create once they're installed, these guys aren't stupid. They, they, they are, some of them are complaining, but the ones that are working and making money with their nose down on the, on the grindstone, tell me, why would I complain about something that hasn't affected me yet? And I'm hoping that it will just help me. So it's kind of taken some time to get there, but we are getting there. That's been my experience. And there is a compensation fund as well. Um, 
and we compensate any commercial fishermen for for almost in some cases twice as much as we would have taken but if we take some pots from someone and they say we took six or seven times the amount we actually took because we know how many we took then we're not going to we're going to continue to negotiate <laughs> so so yeah. um you know as dana knows uh some people you know yeah. want more than they actually <laughs> we know how many pots we take if we've taken some in one case we did take some pots so um but we just have to be fair and honest and don't want to be taken advantage of so what Dave is alluding to and it's something that I wholeheartedly as a commercial fisherman disagree with and I think it's something that both offshore wind industries really need to take another look at because it sets a precedence for abuse and Dave's alluding to what we call a gear claim form or a, a, a you know a, a reimbursement of if a commercial fisherman sets static gear with vertical buoy lines let's say off of Ocean City and one of our survey boats happens to be in that area. And, you know, the boat goes back to port. That night, a tug and a barge combination comes down the bay, and they clean up this commercial fisherman's gear, and the gear gets moved or drugged to a new location or damaged. The next day, since these survey boats have been in that area, offshore wind gets the blame for it. And a lot, nine out of 10 times, we didn't do it, but yet we get blamed for it. And people take to Facebook and say, they're putting us out of business. They're towing up our gear. As a commercial fisherman, gear gets lost. Every time there's a northeaster, gear gets rolled up, tumbled up, buoys get sucked under, buoy lines get cut off. And I don't agree with the gear claim form, although our, both of our companies do. I think it gets abused. And I think it's something that, um, you know, that I am not in favor of. But it's one of those things that I always said that offshore wind just go so far to work with the commercial fishing community. Um, in the Northeast, we're buying brand new fishing nets because guys are getting their bag, their back end of their net tone off on a wreck that they've known that's been there forever, or it's getting caught on a rock and they just automatically say, well, offshore windows, us a new net. So yeah, we're nice, but I think we're too nice in that aspect. And I'm sorry, I get a little heated with that topic. <laughs> well, that's okay. I think we have to close the question segment now because we have some time constraints here. Oh, I see John. I just have, yes, I just have one question. I'm just trying to understand it. Do the turbines face in one direction or do they rotate during different times of the year or the day? Yeah. Uh, Dana said they rotate with the wind. So in this in the summertime, they'll be facing south most of the time so you'll be looking at them from a side view so they always want to face the wind so the turbines rotate at the top uh based on the wind direction as dana mentioned right. that, and, i wanted to make that clear for myself thank you yeah yeah and, yeah, and yeah. not only do they do that that's a great question they do rotate as dave mentioned and they can be locked down as well and and huh. stopped and the blades, if you've ever been on a Dash 8 flying out of Salisbury, when it, when you take off or land, it sounds like that plane's going to come apart at the seams. That's because they feather the props. So we can actually feather the props as well. And I noticed in the in the image that Dave brought up about the uh, at Warwick Tech, they had a prop-like gauge difference. So you can feather the props. Our blades like to rotate at about 11 to 12 rotations a minute. That's how, yeah. even if, if it's blowing 35, we'll rotate the blade to dump some wind off to keep that rotation, that, that sequence to 11 or 12 turns a minute. And that's the ideal sweet spot for those blades. So not only do they rotate to face the wind, but they can be feathered to shed some wind as well. And they can be locked down. Okay. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, they'll, they'll stop at about 80 miles an hour, I think, hours. So. Yeah. Can, I can I suggest that you guys take a look at the remaining questions and try and put your answers in the chat? Of course, happy to. Well, we're actually going to release them now, Joe, if they are, um, if they need to go. But what I wanted to tell everybody is that if you had a question that didn't get answered tonight, these gentlemen are happy to answer it. Cindy's going to uh, Cindy, you're going to put their uh, contact information up, if you could, and then um, 
they will answer you separately and possibly in greater detail than they could do here. So Cindy, you go ahead and do that. I am going to put that up. I just wanted to tell you, I just copied all the questions that are still in the chat that were not yet answered. And in mm -hmm. case you haven't been able to see them, Dave and Dana, I will send them to you. And if if you are willing to um, answer them, we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Okay, be, great. Be glad to. And I'm I'm in West Ocean City on the Commercial Harbor every day. If anybody's ever driving by, poke your head in the door. I'd love to love to chat with anyone. You, you <laughs> might you might have some guests. You might Anytime. have some, exactly that. Anytime you like. Well, I live well, in the woods on Cathal Road, so stop by sometime. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's how. Um, that's us, though, Sin. I know. I'm moving it to the next one. So what I want to say to you gentlemen is that you're uh, welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting, and you're also welcome to leave because we can understand if you may need to do that. But we do want to tell you that you have our heartfelt gratitude for being here with us tonight. That was a lot of information, uh, good information for us to have. And also now we know how to find you guys. If any of our uh, participants here tonight um, have further information they need as they go along, as this whole thing progresses, it's truly revolutionary. So thank you very much. And uh, we will look forward to um, your progress as we go along. Thanks again for having us. Well, thank no. you for having us.